Greetings to all of you friends, and welcome to another episode of the DJP. On this episode, my guest is Anna Cantwell. Anna is a musician, an artist, who actually just put out a new tarot deck, a soul coach, and a mindfulness expert that actually trained under David Nickturn. And if you're not familiar with David Nickturn, he is pretty well known in the Buddhism community, and he was actually a student of Chogyam Trumpa Rinpoche. So that effectively makes her a student of Chogyam Trumpa Rinpoche. Anyway, we talked about mindfulness a lot, like quite a bit. And we talked about letting go, even letting go of the idea of letting go, letting go of the narratives that you've built for yourself, all the obstructions that are holding you back in your life, letting go of it all. Yeah, we talked about finding your true self. Man, we touched on so many things. It's, it's, I can't even remember all the good parts of it. It's because there were so many good parts. Just the whole episode was just amazing. We had a fantastic conversation. So we'll get to that in just a second. But first, some quick business. This episode of the DJP is brought to you by Dr. Spaghetti's Psychedelic Wellness Clinic. Do you suffer from depression, PTSD, childhood trauma, or any other issues? Then come to Dr. Spaghetti's Psychedelic Wellness Clinic. Established in 2020 and serving the world at large. So go to Dr. Spaghetti's Psychedelic Wellness Clinic.com with keyword Dharma for 20% off. Offer not valid anywhere. But now, Anna Cantwell. You might catch yourself sliding in and out of You might catch yourself sliding in and out of all of Do just relax and enjoy it. Just relax and enjoy it. This is an experiment, this is an experiment in, mind in mind formation. In formation. In formation. Forming, forming, controlling, controlling, operating your, operating mind, and your mind and your brain. We're using digital, We're using techniques, digital techniques to overload, to overload and scramble, and scramble, confuse, confuse, unfocus, unfocus your, mind, your mind. The natural state of the brain is chaos. Chaos, Chaos is beautiful. 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 Hello, hello. Hola, how you doing? Doing pretty well. How about yourself? Oh, I can't complain. Mm. Doing very, very well, very well. <laughs> much better than much better than last time we talked. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh, I'm so glad. I'm glad we got to reschedule and get things everything sorted out. A lot has happened uh, since you last talked. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. What's been going on with you? Well, I released an EP, a five song EP of songs designed to help people reprogram their subconscious mind with positive and empowering messages. It's called. Awesome. Yeah. So that happened yesterday, 11, 11, a very auspicious day. That's my uh, anniversary date. <laughs> Well, isn't that hilarious? Because there was another little surprise. Um, I went with my partner out into Joshua Tree National Park. So we live in Joshua Tree. We went to the National Park to film a music video and do a live performance of one of my songs, which is called Let Love Win. And would you believe it, at the very end of our last take, he um, got down on one knee and proposed to me. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so I, take it, I take it you said yes. <laughs> I did say yes, yeah. <laughs> well, congratulations. Think, thank you so much. So I'm just really overflowing with so much love and gratitude. Like between the EP and that, I just feel like on cloud nine. I feel you. What's the, what's the name of the EP? It's called Spirit Guide. Spirit Guide. Right on. And where can, where can people find that at? That's anywhere you can get music. So because yep. it was um, uploaded on 11.11 just yesterday, it mm. may take a few days for some of the like less popular platforms to you know get everything moving, but it's right. all ready to roll on Apple Music and Spotify and YouTube Music. Awesome. So tell me a little bit about what you do besides making music. Yes. Yeah. Making music is, has actually um, come to be, you know, pretty new for me and what I mm. do. I am a soul coach and a mindfulness expert. And really I chose soul coach because for a long time I taught yoga mm. and I really loved helping people work with their bodies on their physical health and 
just, you know, shifting into new levels of flexibility. Right. And I really loved the kind of mental flexibility and the spiritual side of it. Right. So, well, that's, that's kind of where yoga started was with the, the mental flexibility. The yoga yeah. sutras were basically a meditation practice. Yeah. So all, and the, the, all the bendy Bikram type stuff that came later. <laughs> totally. Absolutely. And it's, you know, it's so fun, but I always, I always tell my students, you know, you could sit here and do nothing but breathe and you would still be doing yoga. So Absolutely. That's what I love about the practice. And as you said, naturally it leads you to meditation. I feel like yeah. that mindful movement brings you to meditation. So soon after I did my mindfulness meditation teacher training and that was so expansive for me it introduced me to so many new kinds of meditation hmm. meta meditation vipassana right. um just so much richness right in this right. practice and right. i discovered that well shoot i also really love helping people work on their mindset and their ability to be present and that, you know, I've always been interested in psychology before I was a high school teacher. So I've always been, you know, connected to people and how people learn and grow. So that really naturally led me into coaching. And, you know, for me, there's now a million kinds of coaches out right. there. Right? You can get Obviously. a wellness coach and a mindset coach and a pregnancy coach and a business coach and what. Yeah. Which I think is great, right? It, it's, it means people are opening up to support and guidance, which I think is, you know, really an amazing thing. Right. And for me, for a long time, I was very goal-oriented and aim-driven. Mm, mm, mm. That's really valuable when you're growing and growing on purpose. And I wanted to bring a little bit more of the spiritual side to it. For right. too long, I think I denied my denied the fact that I'm just a really spiritual being innately. I think we all have that connection, of course. It's where we all come from. And for me, I've always kind of been attuned to that, even, even as a little kid. So right. it's a natural path. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what led you to mindfulness? So... As many of us, you know, you kind of need that, what I call like the universal body slam or hitting rock bottom, something like that, right. to really make a big shift. And I wish we didn't always need that. And I believe that we don't always need some big cataclysmic event to make a big change in our lives. For me, it was kind of a slow developing anxiety and chronic stomach pain that okay. really like brought me to the brink as mm. well as you know just add in a little bit of sexual trauma and abuse and you've got yourself you know a really pained fear-ridden body right. and an incredibly fear-ridden mind oh for sure and so you know it was going from walking down the street feeling any moment is someone just about to stab me, like middle of the mm. day, walking, you know, walking me in my college town or something like that. Right. And that was how my brain used to work. It used to always, without fail, jump to the worst and really kind of an outlandish thought, right? Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's what the brain does. The brain has that built-in negativity bias. <laughs> totally. They say, for, they say for every five positive experiences, you'll remember the one negative one. And it takes about it takes about two seconds for the brain to process a negative response. It takes about twelve seconds for the brain to process process a positive response. So just naturally, the brain is inclined to towards that negativity bias. So it's easy to fall into that. Definitely, and you know we have our real lived experiences, and then we have the conditions of culture and right. headlines that are always creating us, you know, fear spikes this way and that way for sure we have alerts and alarms literally attached all over our body so yeah. it kind of makes sense right when you add all of that up to me it just it brought me to this point where i where i said to myself something has to change right. if you are going to get out of this you know i was really depressed just in in a really bad place it was like in the worst place of my life and I started going back to yoga 
because I had discovered yoga really young, but didn't really stick with it. So I felt, right. okay, where are the spaces that I feel that I do feel safe? Where are the spaces that it's a little bit easier for me to build on and kind of marinate in those mm. positive thoughts, right? right? And positive experiences. And that was yoga, right? I was like, <laughs> why would I go to a sweaty gym when I can go to this beautiful, like candlelit space with laughter <laughs> and like nice people? <laughs> so I started doing that and that was really empowering for me. Mm. And it also, you know, that we're talking about like the, the more physically challenging aspects of yoga. Now, right. I'm definitely not one of those, like, I can't, like, put my hand, my feet behind my head. I'm not right. over here doing, you know, pressing up to handstands. And I did experience a lot of growth from seeing, whoa, I can hold crow a little bit longer than I could last week. Right. And seeing those small wins, I'm sure you've heard of, like, the theory of small wins. Just oh, yeah. doing you're making progress, right? right? Little bits along the way. And that was really cool to see. I started to really surprise myself. And then, you know, as someone who had physical trauma stored in my body, mm -hmm. it also helped unwind that. Right. It's really, really crucial. Yeah, I've noticed with yoga, it, much like any other form of meditation, in my opinion, it's, it's the uncomfortability factor. Because... Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if I don't know if you just follow mindfulness or if you follow Buddhism at all. Mm -hmm. But you know, the first noble truth is you know, life is suffering. So it's learning to sit with that suffering. It's doing those those incredibly difficult poses and and being in that moment of uncomfortability and just being at peace with it. Yeah, uh, that I think is the key to it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that there's so much of the practice that doesn't even necessarily challenge our physical bodies, but you know. I live in Joshua Tree now, but when I was living in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. you know, that city for as chill as it can be, it's still, you know, a high performing city. So yeah. sometimes the way more challenging thing for people was my restorative classes mm -hmm. with having to hold, you know, one pose in complete silence for several minutes at a time, sometimes right. 10 minutes and just allow themselves to relax, allow themselves to not always be pushing and forcing. Right. And I right. think that's really uncomfortable for a lot of people, you know? I think people are just so used to it. You know, they're just so used to looking at that next thing, that, you know, searching for happiness in that next goal, that next achievement, that next shiny thing they can have, that they lose sight of what's going on around them at the moment. Yeah. And it, it one one of the big insights I had recently was just let go of the outcome. Do yeah. the work, but without the focus on the outcome. The outcome's mm -hmm. gonna the outcome's gonna be what the outcome's gonna be. But if you if you're mindful of what you're doing at the moment, then the outcome's always generally going to be good. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, our understanding of what's good for us is so warped or can be right? We think, oh, I know for sure that this promotion, that's the right thing for me. That's the next step. I know it's going to be good. It's going to be good for my family. It's going to be good for, you right. know, accolades. And then yeah. what happens, right? You get the thing and you, you get the corner office, you have the whole. And you're still fucking miserable. <laughs> exactly. And I, you know, it's not, it's not just ragging on goals in general, but I do, I strongly agree with what you said. I think for, a happy life we have to come to terms with that nothing is certain right and everything is changing all the time right? yeah, nothing nothing is permanent mm -hmm. and it's and, and by, by saying let go of the outcome i don't mean not have goals because you know you should definitely have goals you should work to attain your goals you should definitely put the work in but get rid of the idea of it working out the way you expected you have to lose your expectations you have to just accept things as they are in the present moment and just like i said lose sight of the outcome just let go of the outcome yeah i love that i work with a lot of my clients on that right they have a they have a goal they have a manifestation they have an aim right something that they're trying mm -hmm. to cultivate and it's often that you know, white knuckled grip that kind of pushes away 
the things that, you know, we really, we really desire that our soul desires. So I work a lot of times on setting soul goals with people and thinking, okay, maybe you have this goal for your physical health, or maybe you have this other goal for your mind or your craft, your creativity, whatever it might be. But is there a goal that you can set with not so rigid an outcome that's connected to what your soul really values? And one of those for me was just being able to see more sunrises and sunsets. Mm. And Oh, Preston, I will tell you, the sunrises out here in Joshua Tree. Oh, I can imagine. Oh, they're so spectacular. They take up the whole sky. You can look in every direction and there's another reflection of this one incredible star that just rules us, you know? It's really that's been something that's so nourishing that it's not like I'm not over here, like having a ticker of how many sunsets and sunrises I see. Right, right. It's just generally making the effort. And that's yeah. you know, another thing that I love to work on with people is saying, okay, you have this idea of a thing that you think you want, but really what if it was the way of being the state of being that you'd like to embody? So for a lot of people, maybe that's something like love, right? Right. So if you're desiring of love, become love. Be that love first, right? Tune into how much love you experience on a daily basis from your family or your pets or your neighbors or your houseplants or random people from Facebook, from like your high school or whatever it is, right? Right. And just seeing that that love does exist. I think it's sometimes easy to lose sight of yeah. that. Yeah. I think the, the idea of love, much like anything else, is, is if you incline your mind to it, if you plant the seed of love and nurture it, then it's, it's going to grow. What, yeah. Whatever you nurture is going to grow. Whatever you surround yourself with, the mind is inclined to. to whatever you practice, you're going to get better at. If you practice love, you're going to get better at love. Totally. And, you know, it, it's, it's the same thing with hate. If you, if you practice hate or resentment or fear, that's what's going to grow. Mm-hmm. And, and those are the things you need to just let die on the vine. I love that. Letting them die on the vine. The garden is so rich with metaphor for us to understand ourselves. Right. right? I love, my parents told me this the other day. Um, that in this past summer, they have this incredible golden raspberry bush. I don't know if you've ever had a golden raspberry, but it's, it's a very nice treat. I, I, <laughs> I have, I've, I've had the, the pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And they told me that it was really overgrown at the beginning of the summer. It was just like, you know, vines everywhere, just, mm-hmm. some, you know, some dead weight. So they did a really heavy pruning process. They trimmed it so far down that they were not sure it was going to recover. And what happens three days later, there's more fruit than they have ever seen on it. Right. (laughs) I love it. And we're that same way, you know, the brain is constantly pruning off neural pathways that we don't need or that we don't use. Right. It's always naturally giving giving us that chance. And of course our bodies, our physical bodies are great at letting go of what we don't need, what has no use to us. So I think that the practice for all of us, and this is an everyday decision is to really learn to not just accept that our life is letting go, but kind of love that our life is letting go, releasing all the time. Yeah. I think that just the freedom of letting go is just that it's, it's freeing letting go of not just, you know, uh, attachments to things and people, but attachments to ideas, mm-hmm. uh, the idea that you built around yourself, the idea of self itself, mm-hmm. you know, the, the narrative you've created for yourself, the memories that you think that have shaped you, the traumas, the past traumas that have shaped you. Those are, those are memories. Those don't exist anymore. Yes, they happened but they're not happening now. And mm-hmm. you have to be able to let go of those things in order to be happy in the moment, just like you have to let go of the outcome of the goal. Yeah. You, know, you have to just be able to let go and, and just kind of lose the conceptions 
that you've built around yourself of yourself. In fact, you just let go of the idea of letting go. <laughs> Whoa, that's a trip. Mm -hmm. It's almost a logical paradox. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It works. For sure. And, you know, I think, um, I don't know if you've heard of Byron Katie. Mm -hmm. She has a practice called The Work. And she would say, she would go as far as to say, memories, the past does not exist. Right? It, it doesn't. Yeah. You know, if I'm holding a banana peel, do you know that I ate a banana this morning? Right. Well, no. All that I know is that you're holding a banana peel right now. And right. I love just her simple metaphors and how that it creates some looseness. And I mean, that was a huge part of my work in releasing my trauma was mm -hmm. no longer identifying with it. And exactly. Trust me, that's a big step. If anyone out there listening to this is working on that right now, I salute you. I send you my love because to have something be so crystallized in your physical body, in your brain and in how your brain functions, it takes, it really takes something to release that and give that right. up. And then it means, well, how do I know who I am? Right. right. And getting to ask that question again, which I think is a fun one. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it takes, uh, I feel like it takes more energy to retain those negative memories than it does to just let them go. Yeah. The body, you want, the, the mind's inclinations is just to cling to it. You know, the, cling to the suffering mm -hmm. and, and let that be your personality. And it's like, that is not at all who you are. Those are events that happen. And you probably are not even remembering the events that happen correctly most of the time because the memory sucks. Let's be realistic. <laughs> totally. It's, I mean, I can't remember what I ate for lunch two days ago. <laughs> totally. It's the, you know, it's a memory. It's not the memory of the event even. It's the memory of 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 the event. It's a, it's a story that we've created for ourselves. It's a narrative we've built just to, to excuse shitty behaviors, really. Totally. And I think that it's a, uh, that's a tough truth for a lot of people to face up to because, like I said, it becomes enmeshed with who you are. But I always tell people this, and I think you would agree, that ultimately this idea of personal responsibility is mm -hmm. so freeing. It's so freeing. It means oh, absolutely. you know, not, not you say, oh, well, I don't get to blame anyone anymore. No, yes, celebrate. You don't have to blame anyone anymore. It's all in your hands, right? Right. It's never in anyone else's hands. Ultimately. Exactly. And as long as you're making wise decisions, you don't have to blame yourself either. Yeah. That's a, the, one of the things I love about the Eightfold Path is it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's not a, Buddhism is not a religion. It's just a, it's a way to live. Yeah. And by by living the eightfold path, it, it frees you of things you feel the need to let go of. Like you have, you no longer have things to let go of because you're living in such a wise manner that you're not leaving shit behind that's going to bring you down. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So who did you do, who did you do your uh, mindfulness te uh, teacher training with? His name is David Nickturn. And you did uh, with David Nickturn, really? Yeah. Yes. That's amazing. <laughs> oh, he's so wonderful. And I remember um, I was really, it was just this incredible synchronicity. So the studio that I was teaching at in LA, it was called Samarasa. Right, I'm familiar. Oh, amazing. I listen to the Duncan Trussell family hour a lot. So I'm, I'm very familiar with David Nickter and M. Samarasa. Oh my God, that's so cool. Well, Duncan was in my first level of training and right. I had no idea who he was <laughs> and then I started you know I got to know him personally and mm -hmm. then once I you know and then I realized I you know I understood um have you seen his show his oh yeah I love it I watched it the first day it came out I binge watched it the the, the first day <laughs> <laughs> it's such a treat. Yeah, I've been I've been a fan of his for quite a long time since since he was doing the Lavender Hour podcast, and that was almost nine years ago, I think. Oh, that's so cool! Yeah. It's so inspiring to me to see the level at which people can touch other people's lives yeah. and and influence and impact them. I to mean, me on, if we're being honest, he's half the reason I'm doing this podcast. Well, and shout out to Duncan! Yeah. yeah, big shout out to Duncan Trussell. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> You'll probably never hear this, but maybe, maybe one day. <laughs> hey, don't, you know, never say never. Hey, and <laughs> said he'll probably never. <laughs> I'm, I'm not guaranteeing it. I'm, I don't know. I don't exist in black and whites. <laughs> I love that. Well, David was a really huge impact on me as well. You know, I was really drawn to him because he has worked with a lot of musicians. Yeah. And at the time, I was working with a ton of people in the music industry in LA, which, spoiler alert, are super stressed out all the time. <laughs> Imagine <laughs> and, that. And very caught up. And it's really, it's really quite alarming to see. I'm not going to quote them exactly because I don't know them exactly, but mm -hmm. there are some very, very high numbers of basically stress related deaths in the music industry yeah particularly heart failure and heart yeah. attack so it's it's just one of those spaces that i feel gosh this is so hard to reconcile music is so nourishing and life-giving and connective and then all these people that are creating this and making it happen are so stressed they can't get any sleep at night or having chronic pain or never see their families. And yeah. it really just, um, it took a little while for me to just sink into that space and, and try to understand. And this is another really cool angle, which is a client of mine connected me to a guy named Richard Wolf, who has his own podcast and wrote an amazing book called In Tune, which is how incredibly predisposed for mindfulness mm. musicians are and that you know the process of listening to music the process of creating and improvising music it requires a great deal of presence right and that instead of seeing those things as separate can you see them together and how they can really nourish each other and and lead to a beautiful, long-lasting career instead of yeah. something short-lived, like some of so many of the <laughs> painful stories. You know. Yeah, yeah. I was actually a, a touring musician for a few years, and it is a very stressful life. It was very, very stressful, and I was pretty miserable <laughs> while I was doing it. I mean, absolutely miserable. You know, for, like you said, not sleeping, uh, constantly around alcohol. So I was drinking far too much at the time. Yeah. I don't even drink anymore. But, mm -hmm. you know, just um, being away from my family, just the constant travel, the stress of having to be here at this certain time and just, yeah, it's very stressful, very stressful. Yeah. I don't miss it. There's certain aspects of it that I miss, but overall, I'm, I'm much happier now. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, it's, it's really tough because, you know, the performance is what, a couple of hours a day and the yeah. rest of the time it's racing to the next venue. It's quick. We got to, you know, depending on what level of musician they're at, yeah. um, you know, my partner, he was touring for many years mm -hmm. and for a long time it was like, can we sell enough merch to make it to the next show? Right. right. That and, was pretty much where I was at. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And most people, right. So, you know, acknowledging that, yeah, that's a really, it's a really tough space. And as much as it's been, a an interesting and and tough impact on a lot of people i do think that covid has really given us the chance to slow things way way down and be absolutely here. it's a, it's almost like a, a global reset or a forced retreat of sorts yes yeah we got the tech turn it off and then turn it back on again mm -hmm. and i think we've, we've done that a couple of times yeah so Hopefully with this reboot, I do feel that there is a, we are reaching a critical mass of people that are awakening and becoming just more aware of the interconnectedness of everything, of their dharma, right, of their path in this lifetime. Yeah. It's pretty cool to witness. It, it is very cool. It's been so weird just watching it, watching it all play out because I was, it was kind of already starting to happen before the the pandemic hit yes. and then since like since march i guess when everything really started shutting down like it's it's become very very noticeable yeah. extremely noticeable and it's palpable it's a palpable change like you can feel the energy change in the world today mm -hmm. it's just super strange yeah i i definitely feel that you know a few weeks before i felt this 
I have been preparing for something. Like I've been training for something. And I do consider myself incredibly grateful to have the toolbox of mm-hmm. tools that I do have to move through this with a lot of grace. And I can't, it's really feels almost wacky to say this. And 2020 is, has absolutely been the best year of my life. Oh God, me too. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, so, I almost feel bad about it because I've seen so, there's so much suffering going on across the world with this, everything that's happening. But for me personally, it's been one of the best years of my life. Yeah. And what would you attribute that to? Uh, you know, I, I couldn't say. I think it's just like, like we were saying, I think it's more just having the time to really, you know, because I had some downtime from work. I wasn't working for a little while. I had a few months off. And I think it was just taking the time that I didn't have before to really sit and investigate my my thoughts, my cravings, my wants, my needs, my desires, my aversions, Beautiful. everything. Yeah. It was it was a, it was the opportunity to push everything aside and truly be mindful of the moment. Mm. Incredible. And mm. you know, in the eternal present, there's so much beauty. There's so much goodness. If you're constantly, you know, thinking about the past or looking towards the future, you're definitely missing what's going on right now. Yeah. And I find that it's such a relief. <laughs> it's so grounding for so many people to say, truly, tr- can you really fully be all here and open your eyes and see that these things that are plaguing you are not happening right now. Right. Right. Exactly. They're, they're all just thoughts. <laughs> your, and your thoughts certainly aren't your reality. <laughs> Thank God. Thank no, God. No, no shit, right? That'd be terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> what misery that would be. And, and the thing is, a lot of people still live in that. A lot of people mm-hmm. don't realize that their thoughts are not their reality. And they, they create this, this narrative for themselves that it's just misery. And mm-hmm. I was one of those people for the longest time. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's only in the past couple of years that I you know, kind of had that consciousness shift. Yeah, you and so many people, myself included, I think things really, really kicked off for me about seven years ago. But then I experienced kind of a second layer and shift about three years after that. That was true. I think the biggest part about that kind of second awakening was, as you said, the giving up of a lot of stories that I had really clung to. I was kind of going through the motions before and I saw I saw things sort of steadily improving because mm-hmm. I had been in such a low place right? right and then once I kind of got out of the pit it was seeing oh my gosh there's you know we're in this incredible world there's so much to explore and receive and I feel that that's how this year so I've been able to create so much and show up so much for my clients or the people in my programs or, you know, putting, this is my first uh, recorded music ever. And that feels amazing. And I also released um, a tarot deck of animal cards to help people, you know, there's a lot of mindfulness woven in because animals are really present. (laughs) And they have a lot of good lessons for us in that. And noticing them also takes mindfulness. So I love to also work in that lane. And it feels very playful and fun to right. get people to learn through the lessons that the animals all around us are are sending to us. Right. I've found a, an interesting exercise lately. I have a cat that I just got a few months ago. But oh. I, what I've been doing is just I'll, I'll sit and I'll watch her. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, animals, they... They lack the uh, the cognitive capabilities that we humans have, the the complex consciousness that we have. <clears throat> so, you know, when you open a can of food and she smells it, it's pure sensory overload. And that becomes her whole being is that craving for that. So you can watch craving play out in your in your pets. And it's, it's the funniest thing to watch. It's like, oh, look what your little brain's doing. You just can't even control yourself right now. 
<laughs> and, and people do people do the same thing, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And then it's see, that we have this gift of metacognition that we can actually think thoughts about the way that we think thoughts. It's the coolest freaking thing in the whole world. <laughs> exactly. It's the investigation of the thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. The fact that we can do that is so fantastic. And it's, it's what leads to liberation, I think. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I would completely agree. And I think what is it ultimately, what is it that we want more than anything is just to be free, right. right? To be fully free, to be free, to be ourselves, to be free feeling in our bodies and our minds. It's right. what could be better? <laughs> yeah, Free from suffering, free from the ideas you've built up. Yourself. And see, that's the thing in order to be free to be yourself, you have to, free yourself of the ideas you've already preconceived of yourself. Yes. You know, you have to, all the things, oh, oh I, I'm this way or I'm that way. It's like, no, those are things you've done, but they don't define who you are. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. And I remember, it's so funny, you know how sometimes when people who maybe they've just been on a slightly different path than you and they've mm. noticed that you've been you've been doing you're into like all this weird stuff lately and right. what's that, what's this person doing and they they look at you and they kind of say with a little bit of condescension you've changed right and i'm thinking glory hallelujah i've changed yeah, of thank course God. <laughs> right absolutely that we are changed that is who we are and i'm thinking over here horrified at the idea of someone not changing not right. growing as they are growing, right? right. It's, it's really impossible. So right. I think that beautiful to embrace those shedding skins, right? Releasing of identities. And something that came up recently, I study the Enneagram sometimes. Just oh, as me, another me too. Me too. I would love to know your type. I'm an artist. Ah, beautiful. I love it. Yeah. have many... Uh, Many artists close to me. Um, I'm three, uh, achiever or performer. It's mm. <laughs> definitely deep, deep within me. And it shared something along the lines of, you know, to sort of to die to self or to release the identity or to shed who you are, you mm. have to have built one up first. Right. So I think that sometimes people come to this point and think, I must simply die to self. I must just release everything without actually exploring what is it that I have built up thus far? Right. What is the personality that I have constructed? Can I understand how those piece this piece led to this piece led to this piece and truly kind of uh, break the facade, right? Dissolve yeah. the facade. Yeah. In, in order to let go, you have to know what you're letting go of first. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. It was it's so simple and it really hit me. It really landed with me. You know, sometimes the really simple truths. And that's that's definitely a lens that I that I carry with me. Right. I take a lot of care and intentionality to not overcomplicate things. Mm -hmm. Right to not make it more any more um, any more complicated than it needs to be. You know, I think a lot of these truths, a lot of things that we're discussing, ultimately. And for if someone is like new to all of this, and you're like, these people might as well be speaking Japanese, and I'm not Japanese. <laughs> I, I hear you. I have absolutely been there. And the seed of what we're discussing, the really at the heart of it, is very simple truth it is very simple it's so simple that it's very easy to overlook yes and most most people do <laughs> it can be right yeah. in your face and you can still be like i don't get it oh my gosh it's the you know it's the thing it's when you're looking for your phone and it's in your hand you know right or when you forgot your glasses are on top of your head it's that moment yeah. and you just feel it's like that like dull moment you know mm -hmm. you feel so silly and we do that all the time i i definitely do that for someone who you know i would consider myself to be a highly intuitive person mm -hmm. i definitely have missed things right in front of my face prime example being my partner 
now, my fiance now, that's mm-hmm. fun to say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he was my best friend for about a year. We were absolutely best friends. We, you know, just, you know, two peas in a pod. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, universe, God, source, whatever you, however you want to say it, um, you know, bring me my soulmate. Like, I feel him here. I know that he's here. And I'm just like completely missing this person right in front of me who's <laughs> treating me so amazing and has these incredible, you know, like these kind of discussions. We have like podcast discussions with each other. Right. And um, he really funny too. He has been a long time fan of Duncan as well, right. which is cool. <laughs> I'm like, wow, so far reaching. And then one day, and this is, this was the beauty of quarantine. It really hit me that I had a strong desire to be with him, not mm-hmm. just as a best friend, but as really a life partner. Right. And it kind of, it kind of went like that. I, he flew me out to where he was staying for the time being in quarantine and he was working on an album and it was just this really magical moment of thinking, oh my gosh, we've just been pouring into each other's lives as friends for a year and now we get to have this next kind of layer right. and it was it was just so beautiful i feel so grateful and i will say this i did a lot of the dredging up cuz boy if relationships aren't a mirror to all of your stuff and projections and, and fears and all of that oh absolutely <laughs> yeah it'll really and bring I, it all out oh totally and i had you know, thankfully we had had a lot of those conversations and I also just, you know, you go through layers of forgiveness and forgiveness is one of my favorite things in the whole entire world. (laughs) It's so powerful. It's so beautiful. It's not easy. I would never say that. And it is simple and it needs to be repeated. To me, there was times when I felt, oh my God, I can't believe I'm still holding on to little cords, little shreds of this person or this idea or this future I thought that we had Mm. and really reconciling that if I'm, you know, asking if I'm desiring this new life long relationship, then I really got to work on that stuff first. I got to clear the cobwebs there because you don't want to be going into the next step without the last chapter really completed on right yeah you know something interesting that I've, I've thought of is forgiveness you can only forgive someone if you actually feel like they've transgressed against you mm-hmm. you know what i mean unless unless there's an actual transgression then, then the forgiveness isn't really genuine you're forgiving something that doesn't exist and transgressions can only really affect you if you let things affect you personally if you mm-hmm. take it personally, because of that sense of self that we've built up, you're like, oh, that happened to me. You know, you, that, that, I, that I, that, oh, me, a oh, woe is me. And that's when you yeah. get into that, that whole forgiveness realm. And that's the kind of shit you just have to let go. I think real forgiveness is self-forgiveness. I think that's, mm-hmm. I think once you can for, for, forgive yourself, that's when the doors open up to forgiving everybody else and letting everything else go. But in order to do that, you also have to let go of that identity of yourself to begin with. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it's, it's just like love, right? How can you actually really love anyone else if you haven't come to terms with deeply, fully loving yourself, loving the parts of your self, right? Right. That feel unlovable. And I think part of that is absolutely forgiving yourself for those things, forgiving yourself for the role that you played in, you know, the things that we say happened to us. That's something that that took me a long time to get to and see, you know, for me, and I'll always speak, you know, on personal experience here that I absolutely contributed to these painful experiences because of who I was being and what I, you know, um, what I allowed. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's For sure. a tough one. Tough one to reconcile. <laughs> okay. I've, I've got a couple of questions. So you said you're a soul coach. Now, if somebody came yeah. to you as a client, what would be the protocol? How would you begin working with them? What, yeah, what's, your, what's your, what's your process? 
So for, for all of my clients, um, I usually take referrals for most of them. So a lot of my clients are referred to me by other of my current clients. Mm. And I'll always have a conversation with them first, at least 30 minutes on the phone, just a consultation to see, okay, where are we at, right? right? Are the things that you're grappling with in my wheelhouse, right? Am I noticing people having blocks in their mindset, right? They're really, or maybe they're really struggling with being present. A lot of my clients also, they're looking for support in developing wellness routines. Mm. And I don't mean like going to the gym, right? Really getting in habits and rituals that cultivate a really rich and soulful life for them. And then from there, it's so much fun. We get to dive into what's their vision, right? What do they see for themselves? And then really the core of it with all of my clients is digging into their soul values. What is it that their soul values and how can we take every single step to cultivate and nurture those values in their day-to-day life? Awesome. Everything. Yeah. So, you know, the people that I work with, it's so funny because there's all of these byproducts, right? Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people that I work with end up maybe starting a business, right? And they find a lot of passion and freedom in that. Um, I just had a client who she bought a school bus and is now traveling the country in a school bus because that's what lights her soul, right? On fire. That's what lights her up. You know, I have a lot of clients who they make more money just because they're putting more intention in what do I do with my money and where does this go? And am I doing things that feel in alignment with with who I really am? Mm -hmm. You know, I have clients who they shift their relationship with their families. They're working on raising their kids in a a mindful way, Right. right? How does that look? So it's pretty awesome because ultimately what I do is help people design a life that they are absolutely in love with that aligns with the deepest part of them, not the surface level, right? Not the things they want, not the things that society tells them you need to have this to like one up your, this other person really truly getting to the core. So we do all of the work that I just talked about, you know, we do the forgiveness, I'll guide them through meditations that are geared towards what they're working with. Right. I'll sort of um, give them, you know, simple action steps to take during the week to make sure that they're nurturing every part of them, right? Some people, right. they're like, okay, I got physical health on lockdown, but my mental health is wrecked. <laughs> right. I can't think straight. And so it's about seeing how can we use how amazing, you know, you're doing at, at cultivating that physical health to mm-hmm. support the mental health. Right. And yeah. how does that look in kind of reprioritizing and shifting what your day looks like? And that's really what I, what I work off of mostly is I take all my clients through a practice called the ideal day and they just let their imaginations go, dream up whatever they can think of. And it's really cool because a lot of times people, they just want a few main things, right? They want love and connection right? They want right. some way to be joyful and express their creativity. Right. And they want some measure of freedom to be able to move through their life freely and live in a way that, you know, feels awesome and that makes other people feel good too. And that impacts the world positively, you know, you know having a purpose, that's kind of the last piece too, is like having really meaningful work or meaningful creation. Right. Yeah. Even if yeah. it's the thing that is paying the bills. <laughs> How long have you been doing it? So I've been doing this for the last, oh gosh. Yeah. The last like three years. And I've mm-hmm. been soul coaching specifically and I've been coaching for the last seven years. Like really since I started doing any kind of personal development work, I was learning a lot about education, uh, got my master's in teaching and did a lot of research into positive psychology. 
Nice. And I just started to see that, oh my gosh, these, <laughs> these things make sense, right? This is not like rainbows and butterflies. And I think a lot of people who, you know, maybe they meet me and they don't know as much about my past, they might see that at surface level. And is right. really beautiful and is really positive. And, and yes, I am. And it's because of like walking through the fire. <laughs> it's because of being through the pits and right, the lows. Exactly. lows. So I, I do really value that and, and also supporting clients who are still in the process of unwinding their traumas. You know? Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, yeah. People, people see where you're at now. And uh, I don't think a lot of people realize all the bullshit that people like yourself and myself have had to go through to get where we're at. It's like, I wasn't always this happy. (laughs) I was fucking miserable for many, many years. And it was, it was because of that misery that I was like, what can I do to not feel this way? And that's kind of what led me to Buddhism in the first place. Like, what can I, what can I do? There's gotta be a way out of this. (laughs) Totally. And there's, that's the beautiful thing is that there are so many pathways You know, for a lot of people, I just encourage them to say, seek it out, care about yourself enough, love yourself enough to seek out many options and find the thing that works for you. And know that all in all, it's going to come back ultimately to a few of those, those really simple truths like we discussed. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. It's just... I think most people just don't take the time to investigate what would help them. You know, they're just, they're just so used to living the way that they've been living for so long that they don't know that there's any other way. Mm -hmm. And I I find that to be very unfortunate because the answers are out there. Not that I fucking have them because I sure don't. (laughs) I'm still working on, still working on them myself. I still have my down moments, but I I come out of them a lot quicker now because I realize they're all bullshit. (laughs) But, but you know, I wish there was just a, a magic wand that I could wave and just and wish compassion and happiness across the world and joy, more joy mm-hmm. than happiness. Cause happiness is fleeting, but joy is pretty tangible. Yeah, I do. I do strongly resonate with joy and, and this, that feeling that that's really what we're kind of craving ultimately. Right. I know, I, I guess th- craving is not the right word, but I, I, <laughs> I don't just, know if we're, I don't know if we're craving joy is if so much as we're craving not being uncomfortable. We're craving the opposite of joy. We're, we're, we're the freedom from not feeling joy. We're craving an escape to suffering. And a lot of people find that in food and alcohol and drugs and um, sexual behaviors that probably aren't the best in the world. You know, they, they have these different releases for, this pain the, you know, it's just, it's a reality issue and they're looking for anything to change their present state of uncomfortability. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's a really big shift and I see this, you know, I see this all the time in people and it really also helps me decide who's, who's ready to do this work and who's not, which is, as you said, is it, I'm trying to get rid of anxiety. I'm trying to, you know, let go of this, let go of this thing or is it I'm trying to cultivate the best life that I can right Right. I'm trying to you know truly whatever it is create a beautiful family or create beautiful art in the world or help people whatever it might be and that's it's a big turning point going from avoiding the things that you don't want to truly creating what it is that you desire yeah yeah for sure. It, it's just so easy to get wrapped up in the vicissitudes of life. And I mean, cause life, you know, life's gonna, life's gonna be difficult. And that's, that's just the way it is. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. There's going to be aging and sickness and death. You know, there's going to be all these things that we have to contend with that we have no control over, but we do have control over the rest of it. So why make life any harder than it has to be? You know? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I'm always geared towards, I'd really love it if my life was really easy. I'm like, I've kind of been through a lot of the hard stuff. And, you know, to me, 
I was just talking with someone about this the other day with one of my clients and Mm -hmm. about shifting to this idea that you can, the lessons that we receive, right? Maybe you've received a lot of like school of hard knocks lessons, or as I described earlier, the universal body slam, sometimes you need the body slam, sometimes you need the body slam to learn, right? Or to, to awaken, right? To whatever the truth is. And then you, when you start to shift out of that, you can ask for gentler lessons. However, that means that you got to tune your ears, your intuition way the fuck up. You have to be really spending a lot of intentional time in silent emphasis on the silent meditation. Yep. 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 And I, I, I noticed that a lot of, a lot of the, uh, guided meditations that you hear I'll have some sort of background music and stuff like that. It's like, no, 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 no. Let's sit in the moment mm-hmm. with, with no distractions. Let's sit with our thoughts. Let's investigate why we're having these thoughts. Totally. That's, that's the point is the investigation. People, people have this misconception that with meditation, the, the idea is to turn your brain off and just be in this bliss state. And that is like the Antith- I mean, that sure, you can be in those states, but that's almost antithetical to what meditation actually is, which is open investigation of the mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fully being there. And I think, as you said, you know, I've had meditations where I have felt, you know, something, something like what I think samadhi is, right. You know, right? This union, this bliss. And then I've had meditations where I have been pouring sweat so nauseous i thought i could throw up any second right. and from nothing you know just sitting there right yeah. nothing else is going on in silence no no guiding and right. i would say on a daily basis my meditation practice ranges from there to there <laughs> from yeah. pure bliss to absolute misery yeah yeah i mean even the idea of nirvana or nibbana um you know, I don't know if you know, but it's an old Pali Sanskrit cooking term, which means to cool a boiling pot. Huh. So um, that's the idea behind enlightenment, basically, is to cool the boiling pot. Just take the simmer down, take the heat off of it, let it rest. Mm. Yeah. And okay. thinking about it in that aspect, it's like, ah, okay, I get that. That's That's something I could relate to. Absolutely. And I'm definitely a, I would never, ever... I- I'm just not. I would never describe myself as an angry person, and I am a very kind of fiery person. Right. Um, passionate. Yes, I'm a passionate person. And I don't know if you dabble in astrology, but I have a lot of fire going on. I'm a Sagittarius, all these things. There's just a lot, a lot that I'm passionate about. And, right. and I love that. And I love this idea. And I have to work at this all the time. And that's what I really want to get across to people is, as you said, the work is never over. It's a day to day, to day to day, to moment to moment to moment choice. We're right. always choosing. And sometimes I have to choose to, like a child, put myself in time out and say, chill the fuck out. No, no <laughs> goals today. No striving today. You're not going to work on any secret project that you've been cooking up. This is surrendering that completely. Right. And that's let, really yeah. what a lot of my work has been. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have to let go of the idea of planning because, mm-hmm. you know, in planning, you're just, like I said, you're just reaching for the future. And it's, you can't ever really be truly present if you're always planning for the next thing and trying to reach that next, that, you know, goal that may or may not be attainable at the moment. People spend too much time focused on the things that they don't have and, and, it's just a lack of gratitude in general. You know, people don't realize what they have right now. You know, I was talking with my uh, meditation teacher earlier today and it was, we were talking about how, you know, the, you get into this idea, you know, of comparison, you know, comparing yourself to others. Why, why, why do they have that? And I don't have that. It's like, it doesn't matter. You have this, you have what you have right now. Mm-hmm. What you have is yours. Absolutely. Quit worrying about what anybody else has. It's of no effect to you. Mm. So, that That's was not- a hard one. That was a hard one for me. That was a hard one. I had to do a lot of mudita meditation, a lot of joy, wishing joy for other people. <laughs> yes. And what a, uh, what a healing thing that is. 
you know, and I, I noticed that when you, when you were saying this year has been a great year and having this feeling, I, I kind of feel bad that this, that I have had such an amazing year, but that, you know, for a lot of people, it hasn't been that way. And that's a big shift that I am, am working through, you know, as we speak, right? right. Is that me, me living in my fullest expression me being the person that is really attuned to joy. And that is honestly just my whole purpose for a living is just to spread love and peace mm. is ultimately a service to people. Yeah. Let them Absolutely. know this has, yes, this has been an amazing year. There is hope there. And that's like one of those cool things that I learned in positive psychology is this, you know, hope is not this, airy fairy idea hope is simply the ability to see that there's a more positive outcome right that there's another way for things to go and that there's multiple pathways to that that's all it is that's a very simple concept right and so attuning to that giving people opportunities for that like heck i'll say it all day yes this year has been an amazing year and it didn't, it came with so much, God, intention, time, taking risks, right? On things that seems like out of my reach, you know, reaching out for support. That was a huge part of this, doing what I needed to do yeah. to stay connected, meditating <laughs> a fuck ton, you know, leaning, doubling down down on a lot of the practices, you know, getting more support. It was it was absolutely a journey and it wasn't by accident. Yeah. Uh, one, one other thing I've noticed is people have, and I'll see if you agree with this, people are reluctant to ask for help mm-hmm. or to accept help. Yes. Most of the people, you know, I, I was definitely this way for a long time. It's like, no, I've got to do this myself. I have to do this. And if you really want to accomplish things in life, life is about connection. Life is about community. Life is about Sangha. And you, you're two people can accomplish much easier a task than one person can, you know? And if somebody offers your help, don't be too so fucking prideful that you, you refuse their help. You know, if they, if they're genuinely offering you their help, take it, it's probably going to make them feel good and it's probably going to help you out. So it's a win, win. Totally. I feel completely this way, right? People will say a lot of times, you know, I've been, I've been really working on this project or I've been, you know, trying to reach the school or I've been, you know, working on this. And I, you know, someone said that they would give me funding or someone said that they would take, take on that X responsibility. But I just don't know if I can accept that. It seems, you know, it seems like too much for them. And it, what it is, is we don't trust ourselves to create boundaries And so we don't trust other people to be able to say yes or no, or to not offer something that they didn't actually want to genuinely offer. Right. Right. And then the other piece is exactly what you said, which is we don't see that what we give of, we always receive back. Right. There's a, there's a practice I've been trying to, to apply lately and it's a generosity practice. It's a, Mm -hmm. and it's any time that, my mind has a, a thought of a generous act to just act on it. Don't overthink it. Just do it because people have this way of when they, they have an idea of they're like, okay, I'm going to do this thing for this person. And then they're like, wait a minute. And they start to think about all the reasons why they shouldn't and, and just say, fuck it and just do it. You know, if, if, if you think about it, I'm going to leave this waiter $20, just leave him $20. You know what I mean? Like just, just do the thing. Like don't over people overthink everything. And that's the big issue is people just overthink everything and they come up with all these reasons why this is going to happen or this isn't going to happen. It's like, you know, just, just get in there and do it. <laughs> totally. As someone who, you know, I always lovingly refer to my own mind, you know, it's a very active one and it can create a lot of things. It's highly imaginative. And oh, yeah. I love this. I love this idea of just, you know what you, and I worked on this a lot with, I feel like when we were out and about more and you could see people's faces cause it's really a mind fuck the whole, not oh, being it's crazy. <laughs> just, just biologically, you know, but 
if I had, you know, felt like I had something nice to say, a compliment or anything, just saying that, right? Never hesitating. And knowing how sweet and amazing it feels when someone says something kind to you, even if it's something that feels like superficial or whatever, right? It doesn't have to be this life altering thing. Sometimes just saying to someone, hey, cool shoes is just a little bit of boost that they need to say, I'm maybe worth something, right? Or there's right. goodness in the world. Right. And if that can do, oh my God, how powerful, how powerful are we? Yeah, exactly. There's actually a practice that uh, my meditation teacher, uh, Mikey Nochelle, he's uh, out of uh, Wild Heart Meditation Center in Nashville. That, no uh, yeah, yeah. I don't, know, I, I don't know, but I'm from Nashville. Okay. Well, uh, they, they used to be part of Against the Stream, but they've since branched off and started their own. They changed the name and they're doing their own thing now, but cool. he's a, uh, it's a, uh, yeah, it's Mikey Nochelle and Andrew Chapman. And they're both just fucking amazing. Um, I think they were both students of Dave Smith. I don't know if you're familiar with Dave Smith, mm -hmm. but one, one of the practices that he's been working with me on is, you know, uh, we were talking about negativity bias earlier and, and the mind will remember the one negative thing over the five positive things. So this is uh, something I've been trying to apply lately is every day, try to give your partner five compliments and try to make it five new compliments because what that does is not only does it make them feel good because you know you're you're giving them a compliment and and that feels good but it also teaches you to be more mindful of your partner mm -hmm. to notice new things about your partner new things that you enjoy new things that that make you closer to them so it's just something that i learned recently and i, I would figure it i would share with you I love that. I absolutely am. I feel that I'm going to implement that immediately. <laughs> and I think, you know, we do a similar practice of acknowledgements and, and asking, what would you like to be acknowledged for? Right? right? Is there something that I would have never seen that you just, just want to receive acknowledgement for? And, you know, taking, and this is what I recommend for a lot of people that I work with. Hmm. Once you ask your partner, friend, and colleague, whatever, what do you want to be acknowledged for? Listen to what they say <laughs> and oh, wow. notice that, store that right for later. And then don't just pair it back to them. I would like to acknowledge you for blah, 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 right? Re take what they say and craft something of your own, right? right. And acknowledge them on a deeper level. Right. And create create action with it. Yes, because it, it attunes you also to what they would like to be noticed for that yeah. maybe because you're not just with them 24 seven or in their head that you might not even see or notice, right? Maybe they went through something internally that they're really proud of for shifting, right? Or releasing yeah. and you would never have known to acknowledge them for that. Absolutely. So when you said you were living in LA for a while, when, when did you move? Was it recently? Was it pandemic related? I, yes. So, you know, you're a part of the mass exodus. <laughs> absolutely. The, uh, you know, the pandemic certainly brought a lot of clarity and I think it's so funny how I feel that prior to this year, everyone's all excited. 2020, the year, the year of clarity, 2020 vision. I'm like, be careful what you wish for because clarity does not always come how you think it will. Right. Absolutely. I don't, yeah, there's a bit, a lot of clarity to this year. I don't think it's the way people thought it was going to be, but it, it's certainly been the way it, I think it needed to be. Certainly. And so I was living in LA, I was living in Echo Park, pretty close okay. to downtown and had, you know, you know, I lived in that spot for three years. That was, you know, it was right around the corner from Samarasa. There mm. were so many things that it brought me. That's where I met my partner. It's, you know, it's was such a rich and beautiful place that led me to so much goodness. Mm. And it, when you're stuck there alone, as was my case at the time, mm. quarantined, when you're in a massive city and you can't really do the things that are kind of the benefit of being in a right. big Yeah. Yeah. It makes it a lot less appealing. Turns Absolutely. Out. <laughs> and it also highlights, you know, starkly the, the more negative things. And for me, it's a really, it's really important for me to be close to nature, to spend time yeah. in 
nature. So Joshua Tree had been a place where at the beginning of quarantine, I had just been looking around for places. Maybe I can go there for a month and just nothing seemed to work out. But there was this one place that I absolutely fell in love with. It was just gorgeous and it felt exactly like what the place that I wanted. And so, you know, time came around where Jake and I got together, we started dating Mm -hmm. and we're talking about moving in together because pretty much right away, you know, after a year of being good friends, we were like, Oh, this is it. Of course. Um, (laughs) Yes. I, I can see clearly now. Absolutely. And we were talking about moving in together and we were kind of like, maybe at the end of the year, you know, let's be reasonable, blah, blah, blah. And then I was like, let's not be reasonable. Let's move to Joshua Tree in September. And he was down. He's very spontaneous, kind of fun. That's awesome. So we... Yeah, why why uh, put off tomorrow till tomorrow, but you could do today. Totally. We did not look back. It happened, you know, within about a month and a half. And basically the people who who own this place, they were running it as an Airbnb. And I kind of said, look, you know, let's be real about this. Do you want your safe, reliable tenant? Or do you want, you know, people that you don't know coming in, COVID, all this stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, and, And just the stress of that. So, that was that was a huge win win. I felt that that really was giving them a lot of peace of mind, and it was giving us this amazing opportunity. We have, oh my god, we have a cactus garden and that's awesome. <laughs> a half and a hot tub, and we get to look at the stars every night. Are you kidding me? This is the dream. Ugh. Yeah, that sounds amazing. <laughs> I've I've only been through Joshua Tree one time, and it was beautiful. I've always wanted to go back. I know they do some some meditation retreats there. Uh, or they well, were for, I don't know. I'm not sure if they're still going on because of everything, you know, happening, but yeah, but it's very it's, popular for that. And yeah. it's also very popular for um, psychedelic ceremonies. Oh well. yeah. No, I've heard <laughs> <laughs> I've, uh, I've dabbled in the psychedelics myself in the past. <laughs> Helpful for opening, you know, wow. they, they really are. They're very, very <laughs> eye it's, it's about, you know, eight years of uh, psychotherapy and about five hours. <laughs> Oh in, in, the, in the right set and setting, obviously. Absolutely. And, you know, that's something that for the people that I work with, I I take really great care for that as well, that yeah. the environment is set up as, you know, appropriately as possible, catered to them. And that, you know, I'm just really excited for all of the breakthroughs. I feel that this will also cause kind of the next layer of a shift in consciousness is just the, you know, widespread fingers crossed availability and legality. (laughs) You and me both, man, because I, I, something I've been hoping for, for a long time. And I think that there's just, you know, there's been so much stigma attached to psychedelic use. There's so many misconceptions about psychedelics, you know, that they're lumped into this category with, with other illicit drugs and they're absolutely not drugs. Yes. whatsoever i mean yes they will they will cause a a consciousness shift and a reality shift but they're not they're certainly not habit forming i don't know anybody who's had a a five gram mushroom dose who's excited to do it again immediately after like oh i can't wait to do that again like nah, it just doesn't happen you don't have those big <laughs> you don't have those big <laughs> breakthrough doses and yeah you're, you're like oh, i'm good i'm good I, I get it now i'm never doing drugs again <laughs> oh my gosh It's so, and it's wonderfully enlightening. And I do believe that, you know, I don't think everyone has to do something like that, right? I think that it's just another pathway. It's another really powerful pathway that we can't ignore the damage that we've done to, you know, our veterans, to our children, you know, to the oppressed people of the world, this PTSD, poverty, you know, layers and layers and layers and layers that collectively we have created this and that there's a really incredible way to alleviate a lot of it. Yeah. A lot. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I've touted the benefits of psychedelic therapy for over 20 years now. And, <clears throat> you know, uh, especially in the past, a lot of people would look at me like, Oh, you're fucking crazy. It's like, well, nah, maybe, maybe I am, maybe I'm not. But, and, you know, like you said, I don't think it's something that should be required of anyone, but I I think that 
it should be available. You know, if, if, if you have antidepressants that cause a litany of side effects available through the pharmaceutical companies, why can we not have natural plant medicine that is absolutely proven time and time again for thousands of years to be beneficial? Absolutely. It's such a shame, you know, and with everything else that's so readily, all the other real drugs that are so readily given, like right. prescribed to people that right. have, it's like, you can't, you can't get a single prescription without, you know, a five page manual of side effects that right. often include things like suicide, yes. with, you know, suicidal all of, ideation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my yeah. God. It's like what's worse, the thing that I'm dealing with or this medication? That's I was just talking to somebody about that the other day. I was like, you know, because uh, we've got uh, medical marijuana here in Florida now. And I was like, hey, and, uh, yeah. yeah, and my, uh, my, my girlfriend's, uh, her sister is a pharmacist and she's staunchly anti-marijuana, but pro-pharmacy. And I'm like, why? Like, I don't understand your thinking behind that. Like, this has no side effects other than maybe like the munchies, you know, like, would you rather, oh, <laughs> it's like, would you rather smoke a joint and chill out and go to bed or pop a Xanax to sleep? I don't know. It just doesn't even seem like a, a fucking choice to me. Like, you know, it's just like, well, one of these it, makes sense. The other one does not. You know, and it's, I really grew up in a very, I grew up in, like I said, Nashville and I grew mm -hmm. up in a really conservative surrounding weed was the devil's lettuce. <laughs> like oh yeah, this. for sure. You know, there was so much stigma. And then what I discovered that was, uh, holy shit, my chronic pain that I have bounced around to specialists for that right. no one can seem to determine what's the cause and that they're basically prescribing me Pepsid and right. that, like just useless. And that when I use cannabis, it completely gets rid of my stomach pain. Yeah. Completely. And it really was, and this is wild, going off of ibuprofen, mm. like the supposedly innocuous, just pain relief. Oh, that, that right? should well, eat a hole in your stomach so and fast. <laughs> it was. It was eating a, it was literally eating a hole in my stomach, <laughs> actually. Yeah. And it took going off of ibuprofen and using cannabis as a way to manage pain related to my cycle that was unbearable, truly, right. that I was told to basically take for ibuprofen every four hours for my whole cycle. Oh, God. That's excessive. <laughs> that was the prescription, right? Jesus Christ. And, and, and they, they, they prescribed that with like, no, no thought given to it. Just say, oh, do take this and yeah, sure. It'll do you want to not be in pain or do you want to have a hole in your stomach in X amount of years? Well, it's up to you. It's like, or you can just, I don't know, smoke a joint and feel all right. You know, it's it, the thing to me is like, how did we get to the point where we made nature illegal? You know, like we have these, we have THC receptors, we have receptors in our brain, you know, for ser you know, the serotonin works because, you know, the psilocybin works because of the serotonin in your brain. These are designed to work with our system. These um, plants are here for a reason. Like we have natural medicine just growing abundantly, but you know, the powers that be say, no, 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 you can't take that because you know, the thing, how will we make our money? Yeah. It's the fear, you know, it's the fear that the massive money machine that they, you know, whoever they is. Right. The, the, the elusive they. <laughs> right. That they created would run out right if all of a sudden oh you can grow your own strain of cannabis in your own home for yourself for your particular needs and you can modify it as you need it's it's all too simple right that would be too easy just like yeah. breathing right just like breathing <laughs> your breath you yeah. know <laughs> so what are your what are your plans for the future Oh my goodness. Just <laughs> spreading the good word of mindfulness. Honestly, I feel very passionately about it. I want to see people feel liberated. I want to support people that struggled with the things that I did, like anxiety and depression and trauma. 
Yeah. Um, I am working on a mindfulness handbook that's, you know, translating some of the more ancient techniques into a little bit more modern way. And then also interweaving that with stories because we know how much people learn from stories and from humor and lightness. I really feel strongly called to bring the lightness and the fun and the humor to it because we just learn better that way. We do. Yeah. Moving, yeah. play, creation, all of that goodness. Right. And like, you know, like we were saying earlier, life's serious enough anyway. Why make it any more serious than it has to be? Totally. And I have, and I feel like I can say that so proudly as someone who has just fallen headfirst into that trap time and time again. That just, oh, like, God, me too. <laughs> I'm taking myself so seriously trapped. Um, you know, for my future, planning to make a lot more music and to help people, like I said, to make more music that helps people truly program their minds with loving, empowering messages because we're already being programmed. It's just not really with loving, empowering messages usually. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't want to blink it. So making a lot of music, working on my book and just serving the people as much as I can. It's amazing. It's yeah. what life's about is service. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right. You know, I always said if I could, if this podcast can help one person to change their perspective, then, then it's all been worth it for me. You know, it's always, it's always that way, you know, yeah. showing up to whatever it is that you do. And I really mean that. I really mean whatever it is that you do with love, with service and, if I, you know, if I can leave anyone with a thought, it's just asking on a daily basis, how can I serve? Yeah. How can I give? How can I contribute? And that collectively, oh my God, we create yeah. such a ripple in the world. That's a world that I want to live in. Right. Yeah. The, I tell people all the time, I'm like, if you want to, if you want to make a positive change in the world, start with, start at home, start with yourself. Yeah. You know, it's like Jack Cornfield says, tend the part of the garden you can touch. Mm. I love Jack Cornfield and I love that quote. It's so, it's like, we're like, but no, those tomatoes over there, those are the thing causing the problem. And it's like, you've got your patch right here. You've right. got your pepper patch. Come on. Take yeah, care. Don't worry, don't worry about what they got over there. You got what you got right here. Totally. I love so, that. Where can people find you at? So I am on Facebook and Instagram. I have a Facebook group where I do live meditations every single Monday and a bunch of those recorded. And awesome. on Instagram, I just show up and share. I do share meditations there as well. And just empowering messages, tools, thoughts, mindfulness, spirituality, really the whole shebang. And I'd love to connect and just know what resonated with you all, listeners. Awesome. Well, I will definitely put links to all your stuff on the liner notes of the episode. I've had a wonderful time talking to you. It's been a really good chat. I, I just love talking to people that are, that are like-minded and, and just working on the path to just waking up, you yeah. know, Absolutely. it's just, it's very, it's very liberating just knowing that there's more people out there who are putting the work in, you know, and actively trying to help other people reach that goal. Yeah. But I just wanted to let you know that I very much appreciate you and I appreciate what you're doing and I care about you. Oh my gosh, Justin. Thank you. Thank you so much for creating this space, this podcast, you know, for supporting the people on their journey and, you know, in another way, in your own unique way. And I'm so grateful for you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks again to Anna Cantwell for being on the show. If you want to get in touch with her, she can be found at AnnaCantwell.com. Her recent musical debut, Spirit Guide, is available anywhere music can be found, and I'll have links to both of those and her tarot deck in the liner notes of the episode. Join me next week when my guest will be the ghost of Jim Morrison. That's right, he's risen from the grave, and he's here to talk about politics, strangely enough. This has been the Dharma Junkie Podcast. Audience tested and Dr. Spaghetti approved. Namaste. <laughs> You earned it.
chaos is beautiful.